Hey, welcome everybody to the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas Speaker Series. Uh, this is our third last talk. So we've had a speaker every month. And before we get into today's details, I am just going to play uh, some slides from our sponsor. And I'm going to mute myself and I'm just going to check for any last minute registrants for the talk. Okay, welcome again. I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to share the slides for the talk. Okay, well, welcome to the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series. It's supported in part by the Heterodox Academy as well as the Counseling Psychology Program at the University of British Columbia. Here is a disclaimer from the Heterodox Academy. Okay, so it actually got extended. So with the appreciation to the Heterodox Academy, we've been able to extend the speaker series uh, until July. And it's in Zoom, but there is a room available on campus for people who are um, at the University of British Columbia Council Psychology Program campus right now. Uh, at the bottom, there is also a disclaimer from the Counseling Psychology Program. The ideas expressed by these presenters may be seen as controversial by some individuals and confronting in some ways. 
The Counseling Psychology Program supports the free exchange of ideas and respectful open debate, consistent with the Canadian Code of Ethics for Psychologists and consistent with the Code of Ethics of the Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association. The ideas expressed by the speakers are their own and no endorsement by the Counseling Psychology Program of their views is offered or implied. So the intention of the speaker series is to increase awareness of heterodox viewpoints and inconvenient facts or findings that do not conform to hegemonic narratives and dominant perspectives in order to promote critical thinking, intellectually rigorous research, and the ability to serve a broader range of counseling clients. After each talk, for those attending in person, the room will be available to engage in a formal discussion. And for those attending online, I have a separate Zoom room set up and I will post the link in the uh, chat uh, momentarily, which will allow you to actually have some small group discussion after Dr. Moncrief's talk. I would encourage people to stick around, depending on the size and the number of people uh, sticking around, we can then open up into smaller uh, subgroups as well. So it's an opportunity to discuss, opportunity to ask questions that didn't get asked, as well as an opportunity to practice listening to perspectives that may differ from your own. So as a reminder, the speakers are guests of the University of British Columbia, and this serves as an excellent opportunity to model intellectual and cultural humility and respectful engagement with speakers who present heterodox or unconventional scholarly, uh, unconventional scholarly and evidence-based research perspectives. I'm not gonna go through the ethics codes uh, principles there, uh, but we do believe that what we're doing here is fully in line and actually encouraging of uh, the ethical principles. Uh, content advisory, um, you're gonna count some perspectives that you may find uncomfortable or disturbing to think about or very challenging to think about with an open and scholarly mind. Some people may get confused. Uh, some may feel validated and invigorated because they now realize that they're not the only ones to think this way. So we do suspect to have a variety of reactions. Um, we want you to feel protected for the students in attendance as you take risks and venture into areas of extreme discomfort, confusion, or upsetness. And you're welcome to talk it out with your supervisor. You're welcome to come speak with me or a counselor psychologist. These could be difficult conversations to have for what may come up for you, but they hold potential to spark considerable growth as a person and professional. But ultimately though, uh, for the people who are affiliated with the Counseling Psychology Program, we want you to become a versatile mental health professional and researcher and maximize your ability to serve a wider range of clients who differ greatly from you. This requires exposure to and making sense of ideas and evidence that can threaten your belief systems. It also requires you to practice the person-centered conditions of empathy, unconditional positive regard and genuineness, as well as intellectual and cultural humility. Now, I wanna briefly share, and I know people who have attended every month have gotten this uh, preamble every time. And so I'm going to shorten it uh, considerably and just stick with what's written in the slides to speed this up. And I apologize to the people who are attending for the first time. But one of the major reasons I, I started the speaker series was that I was really influenced by this research study called Breaking the Bubble, Recognize, or Breaking the Bubble, um, recent graduate experience with the ideological diversity. Simply put, the researchers found that when their students went off into the world of work in social services, they were surprised at how unprepared they were to work with individuals who differed greatly from them and their social circles. They started to realize that they really were in an ideological bubble and a an homogenous bubble that got challenged when they went off into the so-called real world of work. Um, where I've seen this most recently is with uh, a program I'm working with that serves a large proportion of immigrants and refugees from very conservative parts of the world. And so some of the counselors are having difficulty because some of the things that these clients are seeing are not something stereotypically would come out of the mouth of somebody who's an ethnic minority person. But here you have people who are economically disenfranchised, politically disenfranchised, ideologically different, and who are racial ethnic minorities who are not conforming to some of the dominant ideas about diversity, about culture, about affirmative action. And that really put some of the counselors at a spin and they had difficulty working with these clients. At the same time, we ran focus groups to some of these women because the program was a domestic violence program and they sort of, they sort of supported that. 
that just because the counselor spoke the same language or was the same culture, they still felt disconnected oftentimes uh, with counselors who were born here in Canada who were sort of exposed and sort of indoctrinated to the Canadian ways and, and belief systems. And so ultimately, though, the idea is to make counselors and psychologists and researchers more versatile. And so let me share a couple quotations from that research study that support the need for a speaker series like this. Sarah from the research study says, sometimes turning on Fox News or reading different articles from different places, and although you may vehemently disagree with it or think that it's not true in any way, or whatever you think about it, it's still important to read these things and interpret those things. Understand where people who have different views are coming from. Understand what their arguments are. I think that could not only help you empathize and understand those things, but also in terms of if you were having a disagreement with somebody, also helps you understand where they're coming from. Thomas from that research study said, I started running into people that had opposite views than me, and I was not necessarily prepared to have those conversations. It's easy to have productive conversations with people that have similar views to you, but it's very hard to have those same productive conversations when people do not have the same views as you. And Stephanie from that research study said, I think university for the most part, maybe a few times in university, but for the most part in general, university didn't necessarily prepare me for real conversations about ideological differences. Okay, um, here are the list of speakers. We've had some excellent speakers in the past. All of them are available up for public viewing on the, my, my Research Labs YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, you can search it or send me an email. Uh, we're gonna have uh, next month's speaker is Benjamin Bellet from Harvard University talking about trigger warnings. And then lastly, we'll be looking in July at psychotherapy as a Western cultural healing practice. Okay. With that said, I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Joanna Moncrief is a professor of critical and social psychiatry at University College London and works as a consultant psychiatrist in the NHS in London. She writes about the overuse and misrepresentation uh, of psychiatric drugs and about the history, politics, and philosophy of psychiatry more generally. She is currently leading UK government funded research on reducing and discontinuing antipsychotic drug treatment and collaborating on a study to support antidepressant discontinuation. In the 1990s, she co founded the Critical Psychiatry Network to link up with other like minded psychiatrists. She is author of numerous papers, and her books include A Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Drugs, which I've actually used in my undergraduate abnormal psychology class for six years, as well as The, Bitterest, the Bitterest Pills. The Troubling Story of Antipsychotic Drugs, and The Myth of the Chemical Cure, which I've also read would highly recommend. So with that said, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Moncrief. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for that introduction and welcome everyone. And yes, I'm, I'm very uh, honoured to be part of this series of Heterodox Academy uh, talks because I've always uh, probably uh, come at things from a slightly different angle from the mainstream. <coughs> Sorry. So as, as Rob said, I am a consultant psychiatrist in the NHS in London, but I'm also the chairperson of a group called the Critical Psychiatry Network, which is a, a group of psychiatrists who share my um, critical view on mainstream psychiatry, particularly on uh, the very sort of biomedical a version of psychiatry that's been dominant for the last few decades. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now and hope that you're going to be able to see my slides. Let me just uh, find them here. Um, sorry. So. Um, There we are. So my talk's called The Myth of the Chemical Cure. <clears throat> and 
Um, and uh, what I'm going to try and do today is look at the assumptions that underpin the current view of drug treatment for mental health problems <coughs> and present and discuss an alternative way of understanding and using prescribed drugs for mental distress. And I hope we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end so that, so that you can contribute and ask questions. So the talk's based on material that's in uh, my books. These are my three main published books. And to summarize the message very succinctly, what I, what I am saying is that some psychiatric drugs can be useful in some situations, but we fundamentally misunderstand what they do. And because of that, we are massively overusing them and causing <clears throat> a lot more harm than good. In England, currently, these are figures from 2017, almost one in five of the population are prescribed an antidepressant, 17%. That is a huge number. And it has been going steadily up since the early 1990s. There's been an almost four times increase in the use of antidepressants just since the late 1990s. And what underpins this use of psychiatric drugs <clears throat> is this idea that what the drugs are doing is working by correcting an underlying biological abnormality, which is sometimes frequently referred to as a chemical imbalance or a serotonin deficiency. Uh, but sometimes that abnormality is thought to be other things, proposed to be other things such as uh, abnormalities of neural circuitry are currently very, um, very fashionable, although it's not quite clear what, what exactly that means. Um, and abnormalities of inflammatory processes have also been proposed to be uh, underlying mental disorders recently. This idea, particularly about the chemical imbalance origins of mental disorders, has been widely promoted by the pharmaceutical industry as exemplified in this um, advertisement for Geodon down here. Uh, it's also been promoted by psychiatric organizations like the American Psychiatric Association, um, whose leaflet said, leaflet on, um, uh, on medications said, psychiatric medications can help correct imbalances in brain chemistry that are thought to be involved in some mental disorders. Um, it was saying that until January 2021, when it was pointed out that this was not um, uh, thought to be the case anymore, and it's since taken it down. Uh, and it's also promoted in psychiatric textbooks. That's a quote from one at the bottom there. Now, there is no evidence that any class of psychiatric drugs works by targeting underlying biological mechanisms of mental disorders or even of mental symptoms, whether that be a chemical imbalance or anything else. Why is that the case? First of all, we don't know the mechanisms that underpin any disorders or even any symptoms. And placebo controlled trials, which form the bulk of the evidence on which we base the use of psychiatric drugs, do not confirm that drugs act in this way. Differences from placebo can be accounted for in other ways, as I will explain. Other evidence that drugs might have mechanism targeting effects is lacking. And there are other ways of explaining drug action, as, uh, as again, I will come on to. So there are two possible ways of thinking about what drugs might be doing in uh, men when they're given to people who are diagnosed with mental disorders. And the mainstream conventional view is what I have called the disease-centered model of drug action, the idea that they correct an underlying abnormal brain state and that the therapeutic effects that they have arise from the drug's effects on these abnormal biological mechanisms that produce symptoms of the disorder. <clears throat> this is the way that most drugs in general medicine work. It doesn't mean that the drugs necessarily target the ultimate cause of the disease. It means that they act on the biological mechanisms that produce symptoms. So, for example, asthma treatments work in this way. Your Ventolin inhaler, it, although it doesn't treat the cause of asthma, it works on the mechanisms that produce wheezing by, by relaxing the airways and therefore it helps to reduce uh, one of the main symptoms of asthma. Um, and painkillers like aspirin and paracetamol also work in this way. Now, the alternative way of thinking about what drugs do in 
when they're given to people diagnosed with mental disorders, is what I've called the drug-centered model. And I've called it that to emphasize that drugs are drugs. They are chemicals that interact with the biology of the body. And the drugs that we prescribe for mental disorders are a special class of drug that cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain, and they create an abnormal or altered brain state. So far from rectifying an underlying abnormal brain state, drugs are actually causing abnormalities in the brain. Now, sometimes <clears throat> um, those, uh, those altered states produced by the drugs are superimposed onto the symptoms of mental disorders, and sometimes um, that can make it appear as if someone has improved. Um, it, it, uh, the unwanted thoughts, feelings and behaviours are obscured by the effects of the drug. Uh, so we can think of this with uh, the use of alcohol for something like a social anxiety disorder, the effects of alcohol intoxication, as we all know, um, include these uh, this effect of social disinhibition, which when it's superimposed on feelings of social anxiety, can result in an improvement. Um, opiate anaesthetics also work partly in this way. That's an example from general medicine. So opiate anaesthetics have some disease-centered action by working on, by acting on pain conduction mechanisms, but they are also, unlike painkillers like aspirin and paracetamol, they are a psychoactive drug. They change the normal state of the brain and alter mental states and feelings and behaviours. And one of the char characteristic alterations they produce is this feeling of emotional numbing or disengagement, so that people who've taken opiates for pain will often say that they still have pain or they still have some pain, but they don't care about it anymore. And that aspect of their action is what I would call a drug-centered action. So this drug-centered view of uh, what psychiatric drugs are doing um, emphasizes that the drugs that we're prescribing are what we could call psychoactive drugs. And by that, I mean drugs that produce psychological and behavioral alterations to normal functioning by acting on the brain. So, of course, the drugs that we're familiar with, um, with uh, associating with that term psychoactive are recreational drugs like alcohol and cocaine. But the drugs that we use for mental health problems also change normal mental states. Uh, and this is something that is really important to recognize because it has not been emphasized enough. So psychoactive drugs create altered mental states, that is they change normal sensations, cognitions, emotions and behaviors. Um, there are linked physical alterations, so drugs that produce sedative, um, sedative feelings, uh, that are sedating, have both mental and physical effects. Drug-induced sedation is both a mental and physical state. Psychoactive drugs can produce changes that are pleasant and that some people enjoy. They, uh, we often then refer to them as, um, as producing euphoria uh, and recreational drugs by definition um, make some people feel good, not necessarily everyone. But some psychoactive drugs produce changes that most people find unpleasant, and many psychiatric drugs are generally unpleasant to take rather than pleasant, particularly the antipsychotics. But the important point is that the alterations that the drugs produce occur in anyone, regardless of whether or not they have a uh, mental disorder, and indeed behavioural cholera correlates of the changes can be seen in animal studies as well. Of course, there's individual variation, so uh, that has to be taken into account. So just to emphasize again, psychoactive drugs are drugs that change the normal state of the body and particularly the brain. And these changes are manifest in changes in sensations, mental activity and behavior, as well as physical functioning. Now, People have used psychoactive substances to change their states of mind for millennia. This is a, a picture by um, Hogarth of the gin epidemic in the 18th century in London. 
And this is a quote from Aldous Huxley, who described how people like to take chemical vacations from intolerable selfhood and repulsive surroundings. And this um, understanding of the drugs that we prescribe for mental disorders, this what we could call drug-centered understanding, was how drugs were understood to work prior to the 1950s. And you can see this in the way that they were advertised. This is an advertisement for the sedative class of drugs, the barbiturates, which is clearly emphasizing its sedating and relaxing properties. This is an advertisement from the 1940s for amphetamines, which were widely prescribed for depression and neurotic conditions by general practitioners. And this advertisement is clearly um, emphasizing the stimulant properties of the drug, how it's going to make you smarter and more confident and more energetic. <clears throat> now, the first uh, generation of modern psychiatric drugs were introduced in Europe in the 1950s. Uh, the first ones were what we now refer to as antipsychotic drugs, but when they were first introduced, they were understood again according to this drug-centered model. So the first, um, the first drug in this um, class of drugs was chlorpromazine, which was first used in French psychiatry in 1952. And at that time, as I said, it was regarded as a special sort of sedative. Uh, it was welcomed, people thought it was better than the previous sedatives that they were using, which were, which was mainly the barbiturates, but it was nevertheless seen as a sort of sedative. And indeed it was referred to as a major tranquilizer um, and a neurological inhibitor, uh, and then as a neuroleptic, which means something similar to seize or restrict the nervous system. And this is an advertisement for one of these early antipsychotic drugs from 1960, which is clearly emphasizing their tranquilizing properties. And uh, along with that, they were widely advertised for all sorts of indications that might be uh, amenable to a sedative or tranquilizing substance, including agitation in the elderly and behavior problems in children, as well as anxiety in adults. But gradually, over the course of the 1950s and 60s, ideas started to surface and started to be discussed that maybe they were doing more than tranquilizing. Maybe they were actually acting on the disease of psychosis or schizophrenia in some sort of specific and targeted way. These are quotes from textbooks that suggest this much. And by 1970, this is an advertisement for the same drug as as is, as is ad advertised in this advertisement. But this is advertisement is showing you a target. It's telling you that this drug is targeting uh, something to do with psychosis and schizophrenia. And it is referred to in this um, advertisement as an antipsychotic. Uh, it's a very psychedelic target because this is the 1970s, but nevertheless, the, the point is that it's a target. A similar change happens with the uh, antidepressant drugs. The first antidepressants were drugs that were being used in tuberculosis, and they were actually very similar to stimulant, to, to amphetamines, to stimulant drugs. Uh, and early articles make that very clear and refer to the stimulant properties of these substances. Later papers start to refer to their stimulant properties as side effects and start to talk about them having a therapeutic action that's different from their stimulant properties. And by the 19, uh, late 1960s, uh, advertisements and textbooks are referring to antidepressants again as having specific thymoleptic, that means anti-mood, anti-depressed mood effects. Um, and appearing to act specifically against depressive symptoms and being much more specific than stimulants. So basically what happens over the course of the 1950s and 60s is a change from a drug-centered view of what, what drugs do when they're given to people with mental health problems to a, to a disease-centered view. And you can see this change most clearly in the way that drugs are named and classified. So prior to the 1950s, drugs are 
crudely classified, because no one's very interested in drugs at that time, into drugs with sedative and stimulant properties. And there's some attempt to distinguish different sorts of sedatives, but, but not very much emphasis given to that. From the 1950s and 60s onwards, drugs come to be named and classified according to the disease they are thought to treat. So we start to talk about antipsychotics, antidepressants, anxiolytics, mood stabilizers, etc. And the really important point is that this transformation does not occur because of accumulating evidence for the disease-centered model. There was, and there still is, very little support for the disease-centered model. That's the idea that drugs work by targeting underlying abnormalities. Um, in particular, placebo-controlled trials do not distinguish disease-centered from, from a drug-centered action. So what might evidence for a disease-centered model consist of? Well, first of all, if we had ev independent evidence of underlying brain abnormalities that were likely to be corrected by drugs, that might support a disease-centered model of drug action, for example, dopamine or serotonin abnormalities. At the very least, we would want to know that drugs that were thought to are thought to have specific effects in certain disorders by targeting underlying mechanisms had superior effects to drugs that were not thought to have the same specific or targeted effects. But even if we did have evidence of this, we'd still need to exclude the impact of the psychoactive effects of the drugs uh, themselves. So is there any evidence of, um, of any of these things? Well, first of all, uh, there are various hypotheses about the neurochemical origins of certain um, mental health conditions. For example, the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, which has been around since the 1960s. Uh, it was first dreamt up when people noticed that the antipsychotic drug haloperidol acted on dopamine receptors. So it was a sort of backwards thinking exercise. People noticed that haloperidol affected dopamine receptors. They assumed that the disease-centered model of drug action is correct, and therefore they concluded that schizophrenia must therefore be something to do with dopamine receptors. But actually, um, meta modern meta-analyses have shown that the effects of antipsychotics cannot simply be attributed to dopamine. Dopamine is not central for all effects, for, for the action of all antipsychotics, and particularly it's not central for the action of clozapine, which is thought to be a particularly effective antipsychotic. Um, and there were various other bits of evidence that were thought to support the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, such as the fact that stimulants, uh, stimulant drugs like amphetamine can produce psychosis. That was thought to be due to their effects on dopamine, but actually it turns out it's never been pinned down to dopamine and they have a wide range of effects on other neurotransmitters, which are likely to be just as involved. Um, recently, there have been some studies showing that uh, there's some overactivity of, uh, of um, in, in the dopamine system in um, people with acute psychosis. It's, the studies are rather um, inconsistent. A lot of them are um, among people who are actually taking uh, antipsychotic drugs or have recently stopped them and, and they have an influence on the dopamine system. Um, but, but the main problem with these with these studies is that we know that dopamine is involved in many things that are likely to be present during psychosis, but are not specific to psychosis. So we know that dopamine activity is increased when someone is aroused, is paying a lot of ten attention to something, is moving a lot, is stressed, is cold, is hungry, all sorts of other things. Um, and none of these things have been controlled for in these, uh, in these experiments. Uh, and that's just to show you the um, profile of re the receptor profile for different antipsychotics. Uh, the, the dopamine D2 receptor, which is thought to be the main, the main receptor involved in schizophrenia, is the yellow one. So you can see that haloperidol indeed targets mainly dopamine D2 receptors, but the, all the, these other antipsychotic drugs target, uh, are targeting a range of other receptors more commonly than they are, more frequently or more profoundly than they are. Uh, targeting the dopamine D2 receptor. What about neurochemical theories of depression? Well, 
Um, these have been very widely pop, um, publicized by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and again, one of the strands of evidence that is thought to support them is the idea that antidepressants have effects on depression. Um, but it turns out there's little evidence that there is any serotonin or noradrenaline abnormality or dysfunction in depression. I have just conducted a systematic review of all the strands of evidence, main strands of, of research that have looked at serotonin in people with depression. And the evidence is either negative or, it, or completely inconsistent. A lot of the studies have been done with people who are taking um, serotonin affecting drugs. Uh, and, and even those don't show very convincing effects anyway. What about the idea that antidepressants, for example, um, have, have specific effects uh, and, and are better than drugs that don't have specific effects? Well, it turns out that's not true either. A whole range of psychoactive drugs have effects in depression that are uh, as, um, uh, as strong um, as antidepressant drugs, uh, including amphetamines, stimulants, um, anti various antipsychotics, diazepam, which is a benzodiazepine, and opiate in one study, um, and, and various other drugs. So, what about the drug-centered model? And I hope I've, uh, in that um, very brief overview, convinced you that maybe there are problems with the disease-centered model. Uh, I've, I've covered the evidence in a lot more detail in, in, my, um, in my writing, and there are lots of papers online that you can look up. Uh, so I'd like to move on to what the drug-centered model means. Uh, so just to recap, what does it mean about how psychiatric drugs work? Well, what it means is that, that there is an interaction between the psychoactive effects of the substance and the symptoms or problems that someone is experiencing, and that psychoactive drugs offer, often replace or suppress underlying distressing emotions and thoughts. But we shouldn't forget that drugs also have placebo effects, and psychoactive drugs probably have particularly powerful placebo effects or amplified placebo effects because people are well aware that they're taking an active substance rather than an inert placebo. So both of these mechanisms may make a drug look different from a placebo in a randomized controlled trial, but the question is, are they worthwhile? So if we want to think about whether a drug is worthwhile, we need to know a lot about what it does. We need to know all the full range of changes it produces in someone's mental state and, and uh, sensations and behaviours, both in the short term and the long term, and unless someone's meant to stay on this drug forever, what happens on withdrawal. We need to know all the physical changes that happen, all the bodily changes in different bodily systems. We need to know whether there might be some changes that are not reversed when, when the drug is stopped that persist. And then we need to think, are these changes likely to be useful in this particular individual situation? Do they outweigh any, if, if there are useful effects, do they outweigh any adverse effects? And are there alternative ways of addressing this individual's problem? Now, psychiatric drugs have psychoactive effects, and this is a, a, a summary table. Um, so the first thing that we need to think about if we're considering prescribing any particular drug is what sort of psychoactive effects does it produce? What sort of alterations to normal mental and physical functioning, um, mental and behavioural functioning, does it produce? So just as, a, as an example, quickly, antipsychotics, as I, uh, as I said, was thought back in the 1950s when they were first used, are particular types of sedatives. Uh, so they produce sedation, mental slowness, um, cognitive impairment, um, but they're particular types of sedative that have a, um, a, a characteristic effect of suppressing emotions and producing emotional numbing or blunting. And along with this goes a loss of libido, a loss of motivation and initiative. And this is often why people find them unpleasant to take. Um, so given that understanding of what, what antipsychotics do, we can see that maybe if someone is acutely psychotic, they may be useful in 
um, slowing down their psychotic thoughts. If someone's thought processes have been overtaken by, um, by delusions and hallucinations, it may, be it may be useful to dampen those down a bit and also to dampen down the emotional reaction that someone has to those thoughts or the emotional investment they have in those thoughts and experiences. Um, Oliver Sacks was a famous neurologist who wrote a book called um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And his brother had schizophrenia and uh, was prescribed antipsychotic drugs. And he described taking antipsychotics as feeling rottenly normal, which I think is really well illustrated in this clever cartoon by someone who calls herself anti-psychiatry. Uh, and it shows you the, the grey normality of um, induced by antipsychotics compared to the excitement and danger um, and, and, and um, fearfulness of, uh, of a psychotic state. Uh, so, in other words, antipsychotics may be useful for people who are in an acute psychotic state, um, but they are not necessarily necessary for everyone in that sort of state, and they are intensely disliked. So it is important that we try and find alternatives, and there is some evidence that, that, that some people can get through a psychosis with um, good psychosocial support without medication. But, the, the, but the, there are even greater questions about long-term treatment uh, because, of, because of the sedation and the impairment to motivation and the flattening of emotions that they cause. So all the research on long-term treatment has consisted of taking people who are already established on antipsychotics and randomizing some of them to go on to a placebo, usually quickly. And what you find in that situation is that people who are randomized to discontinue their antipsychotics are more likely to relapse and more likely to be hospitalized. The trouble is that we know that antipsychotics produce um, discontinuation effects, and those discontinuation effects may actually make it more likely that someone has a relapse. Um, or might, might be misinterpreted as a relapse. And so what we really need to know is what happens in the long term. And up until recently, there were no really good long term follow up studies of randomized, randomized trials. But there was one published uh, a few years ago in 2013, a seven year follow up of a randomized trial that involved a gradual reduction of antipsychotics compared to maintenance treatment. And this study found that although there was an increase in relapses early on after the discontinuation of antipsychotics, um, the, uh, uh, with time, the relapse rates equalized between the discontinuation and the maintenance group. And it also found, really importantly, that the proportion of people who experienced a full recovery, a full social recovery, was much higher, um, almost... Uh, twice as high, more than twice as high, in the group who were randomized to antipsychotic reduction and discontinuation compared to the group who were randomized to maintenance treatment. One of the causes of these poor long-term outcome, this poor long-term outcome in people with antipsychotics may be that there is good evidence now that long-term antipsychotic use results in brain volume reduction, i.e. brain shrinkage. This has been most convincingly demonstrated in a couple of very well-conducted um, animal experiments that have been done over the last 20 years. And um, as Rob mentioned, I am running, currently running an antipsychotic discontinuation study to look at the results of a gradual reduction and discontinuation of antipsychotics in people with um, schizophrenia and psychosis, and we're hoping to have results of that soon. Right, I'd like to talk a little bit about antidepressants now. Um, and uh, so again, the first thing to, to ask about antidepressants, if we're thinking about using them in people with depression or in any other situation for that matter, is what sort of mental alterations and physical alterations do they produce. Now antidepressants come from a wide, uh, a wide range of chemical classes and therefore produce really quite different sorts of subjective and objective effects. 
So I'm just going to turn my light on, excuse me. So hopefully you can see me better. <laughs> um, so tricyclic antidepressants, for example, are, um, are chemically quite similar to, um, to antipsychotic drugs. So they're very sedating and cause cognitive impairment and are quite unpleasant to take. SSRIs have much more subtle effects uh, and, and the effects are not necessarily that noticeable immediately, but after long-term use, there seem to be consistent reports that they produce emotional numbness, which is associated with their well-known ability to cause sexual dysfunction, in, including reduced libido and reduced sexual sensitivity. Uh, and they're also associated with feelings of lethargy. Uh, Relatively new drugs um, include antidepressants, include metazapine and venlafaxine. Metazapine is highly sedating, and that the sedation seems to be associated with weight gain. And venlafaxine causes lethargy and emotional blunting. So the question is, uh, uh, sorry, and these are some descriptions of the sort of alterations that people experience when they're taking SSRIs and venlafaxine in particular. So people describe listlessness and lethargy, a total loss of libido, inability to care about anything, numbness, blankness, feeling sleepy all the time. Um, SSRIs in particular also seem to, in some people, induce feelings of agitation and people talk about feeling um, anxiety and panic, feeling suicidal, having mood swings. And these effects seem to be more common in younger people for some reason we don't understand. So the question is, are these effects likely to be useful in people who have, um, who have depression or as I say, any, anything else? And uh, this was a large systematic review of antidepressant trials that was published in 2018 and was declared to show that antidepressants are effective after all. Don't worry, they do work and more sh people should be taking them rather than fewer. Now, the, if you look at these studies, what you find is that the difference between antidepressants and placebo is, is very small. Um, on measures of depression rating scales, which are the primary outcomes in all of these studies. Uh, this is the, this graph shows you the difference in Hamilton depression score rating, ratings um, between, people, um, between people on the antidepressant in blue, on the placebo in red, and that's compared to the baseline values, that's the green column, column um, and the uh, the purple column is the total Hamilton score. So the difference between drugs and placebo is around about two points in most studies. Um, baseline scores are usually in the late 20s, sort of 28 points, sometimes higher, and the score total is 54 points. So two points doesn't sound like a lot. Um, and uh, if you compare it to measures of clinical global improvement, that's a, a general global measure that is rated by um, clinicians, what you will find that is that people need to, there needs to be at least a three point change in Hamilton ratings, Hamilton depression score ratings to register as any change. Uh, and uh, sorry, a three point rating doesn't rate, register as any change. You need at least an eight point rating to register as showing a minimal degree of improvement. So a two point difference doesn't seem to, uh, to be significant. Evidence on long-term outcomes also suggests that antidepressants are not producing um, any benefit. The huge star D study, which uh, enrolled about 4,000 people and gave them gold standard antidepressant treatment, um, showed that only a very small number of people actually recovered, got better, 1,500 people got recovered, um, but the number who got better and remained in the study and didn't relapse was only just over 100 out of the 4,000 or so that enrolled after a year. <laughs> 
But even these small differences may actually not be real differences between the drug and placebo. They may be accounted for by those amplified placebo effects that I talked about earlier. And this is because in many antidepressant studies, people can identify whether they've got the antidepressant or the placebo. And sometimes the researchers can identify this on the basis of, of the side effects that people describe. So this, these are just studies where um, people have been able to identify whether they're getting drug or placebo more accurately than would be predicted by chance. It's not always the case. So in this study by Chen et al, which compared the antidepressant sertraline with hypericum, that's St. John's wort and placebo, people didn't guess any better than chance. And this is what this study showed. It showed that although people were, didn't guess accurately in this study, what people guessed they were getting was a very strong predictor of their outcome. So although there was no actual difference between any of the statistically significant difference between any of the drugs, um, that's the the, those are the columns on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you can see that people who would guess they were on one of the active drugs uh, showed a much greater level of improvement than people who guessed they were on placebo. And if, as we know, in many studies, um, people can accurately identify whether they're on the drug or the placebo, it's likely that, that those perceptions um, are going to influence their outcome, as, as can be shown here. So antidepressants probably have very minimal, if any, benefit. What, and what adverse effects do they have? Well, common adverse effects include sexual dysfunction, as I mentioned earlier, lethargy, withdrawal effects, which um, are increasingly being publicised and occur in at least 50% of people who take them, and may be severe and prolonged in some people. Very worryingly, the sexual side effects may also persist after people have taken, have stopped taking the drugs. We don't know how many people this, this occurs with, but, um, uh, but, but given the number of people that take antidepressants, this is obviously a, a real worry, and it's being increasingly reported in the sexual health literature. Uh, and then there are some rare complications, but they're serious ones, fetal abnormalities, bleeding, fractures, because antidepressants cause osteoporosis, uh, and suicidal behaviour and aggression in young people. So from a drug-centred perspective, I would suggest that antidepressants, drugs that we call antidepressants, have a very limited role. Sedative drugs such as benzodiazepines might be useful temporarily if someone is very agitated or for insomnia, but we have to be very careful about the, the problem of dependence with these drugs. Antidepressants do seem to have this effect of dampening emotions. Um, there might be some people who think this might be useful for them, but the trials don't really seem to suggest that these drugs are helpful for people with, with depression at least. Uh, and, and, and the effects for anxiety aren't large either. Antidepressants do have some serious adverse effects. Um, and in addition to their physical adverse effects, there's also the consideration that being in an altered state on a prolonged basis may actually stop people from making good use of therapy or taking other measures to help themselves recover. So if we, to be what I feel is honest about antidepressants, um, we should be telling people all this information. At the moment, people are, or, or over the last few decades, people have frequently been told that antidepressants work by helping to normalize an underlying serotonin imbalance, or at least that is implied because people are just told that the antidepressant will improve their depression without any further explanation. If people, if, if antidepressants were being presented according to a drug-centered view, then people would be told that the medicine alters the way that people think and feel, not just people with depression, but everyone. But we're not sure how, because it's not been studied very much. It seems that they may dampen down emotions, which is associated with a reduction in sex drive, and they also seem to make people lethargic. We should also be telling people that there's no thorough research into the effects of taking the drugs long term, but people report that it can be difficult to come off them, sometimes very difficult, and that 
sometimes sexual side effects can persist after stopping taking them. So just a couple of conclusions about the drugs, and I just want to say a, a couple of very quick words about how we've got into this situation, and, and then we'll have some discussion. So drugs prescribed for mental distress or disorder do not work by reversing or targeting an underlying disease or abnormality or chemical imbalance, or at least we have absolutely no evidence that that is what they are doing. They do produce altered physical and mental states, and they have unpredictable and under-research effects, especially in the long term. These alterations they produce interact with mental symptoms in various ways, but there's little evidence that they produce net benefits for use in common psychological complaints such as depression and anxiety. So if that's the case, why on earth did the disease-centered model catch on and become so influential and predominant? I suggest that it's because of a combination of interests, because of the interests of the psychiatric profession, the interests of the pharmaceutical industry, and also because of political interests or the interests of the government and the state. The disease-centered model started to become popular in the 1960s and 70s at the same time that the recreational drug scene was taking off. And I think one of the important um, uses of the disease-centered model has been to distinguish the prescribing of psychiatric drugs from the use of recreational substances, which are often used not just to get high, but to alter people's, alter unwanted mental states, to reduce anxiety, distress and pain. The pharmaceutical industry obviously stands to make a lot of money out of, um, out of uh, selling psychiatric drugs. But back in the 50s and 60s, the pharmaceutical industry was reasonably comfortable with a drug-centered model. Um, and this advertisement is, is and, and other advertisements at the time are fairly honest about what these drugs are doing. Here, here this advertisement said, says, beset by the seemingly insurmountable problems of raising a young family and confined to the home most of the time, her symptoms reflect a sense of inadequacy and isolation. Um, so it's not telling you that she's got a disease that the drug's going to treat. It's telling you she's isolated for understandable reasons. Um, but you can relieve that by giving her this drug because you can't, can't do other things that, you know, spend enough time with her or give her enough support in other ways. Nowadays, we're just told that the drug makes you better. See depression, see a difference. It's cured you myster mysteriously um, with the implication that it's treated this underlying disease, which the pharmaceutical industry has previously in all their propaganda told people that they have. This quote from the um, Eli Lilly site for uh, Zyprexa, I think really summarizes why the disease-centered model is now useful to the pharmaceutical industry. It suggests that antipsychotic medicines are believed to work by balancing the chemicals found naturally in the brain. Now, Zyprexa, that is olanzapine, makes people put on massive amounts of weight. And you just have to look at someone to know that they are taking something which is interfering with their natural, normal physiological functioning. So this message really helped to uh, counteract that impression that you would immediately get from looking at someone who was, who was taking this, this drug or had taken it at reasonable doses for a, a, a significant period of time. Um, and it, it, this message about the chemical imbalance also helped to dispel the, um, dispel the controversy that had arisen over the use of, over the mass prescribing and dependence on benzodiazepines that started to be exposed in the 1980s. So the idea of giving people a drug in this way to just make them anesthetize them a little bit to their situation suddenly got a bad name in the 1980s and the pharmaceutical industry had to rethink their tactics and had to sell the idea that their drugs were treating a disease rather than just um, obliterating people's feelings. And finally, the political considerations, the uh, conceptualizing mental health problems as a disease and drug treatments that modify people's 
mental states and behaviors as disease treatments is a convenient way of resolving some very thorny political democratic problems. It enables you to force people whose behavior is upsetting other people or who, who are dangerous to other people um, to take drugs that pacify them um, without having to uh, get into all the issues about civil liberties because you can just say we're treating someone's disease. And of course, it enables governments to ignore all the reasons why people might be unhappy and distressed and anxious uh, in our modern day society by suggesting that they have a, a brain disease which needs a chemical solution rather than um, they are unhappy because of the, uh, their, their social and economic circumstances. So I'm going to stop sharing and I would welcome some discussion and some comments. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Moncrief. Just as a reminder, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you click that, you can type your questions in there. As a reminder, uh, due to the limitations of the Zoom webinar feature, there's no discussion here directly, but we are going to open up some Zoom rooms at, uh, in 30 minutes. And so I'm going to put it back in the chat again. And so this is the optional piece. If you want to stay after the Q&A, I put it back in. Please copy and paste that link now and have it handy because when I close this webinar the the chat goes as well and as soon as the talk is as soon as the question period is over then I will uh, open up the zoom room for anybody who wants to do discussion as I mentioned depending on the number of people there sometimes we break up into smaller groups and sometimes we have a bigger group discussion as well with that said thank you so much I see some questions have poured in and a couple just came in the last minute or two um, let me go to the first question here. So, Dr. Moncrief, I'll just read the question out to you if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. If you want to read it, you can click on the Q and A as well. It'll yes, yes, just, just found it. <laughs> okay, uh, this is from Deborah. What role does brain inflammation from bacterial infections play in various disorders and anxiety slash panic responses, i.e., Lyme disease, Bartonella, or Babesia? Oh gosh, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm not, not an expert on, um, on in infectious disease. Uh, I mean, I know that, you know, Lyme disease can become chronic and, uh, and, and affect people's mental states. And that presumably is due to some sort of pathology. But I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know what it is. No problem. Um, okay, next question is from Randy. Uh, Cipriana's effect sizes and R and risk ratios, I guess that means risk ratios, once calculated based on his earlier study looked at placebo response rates, were an almost exact replication of Irving Kirsch's work calling antidepressant effectiveness into question. What do you make of the apparently uncritical enthusiasm with which Cipriani's supportive conclusions were greeted by the psychiatric community? Yeah, good, really good question. Um, it was extraordinary. It was like... Uh, uh, an extraordinary media campaign to to promote that study, even though, as you say, it was actually just replicating the results that had been found in other in previous meta analyses, which showed very small differences between drugs and placebo of questionable clinical significance. Um, I think uh, I, I think it was a concerted effort. I think there was a lot of media, you know, a lot of um, media savvy marketing went into it to counteract lots of negative publicity that antidepressants have had over the last decade, including a lot of negative publicity around the severity and um, prolonged nature of the withdrawal effects that they can cause. So I think it was, it was very deliberate. Um, uh, another question is, you know, why did the media take it up so uncritically? I suppose, you know, the media the media do listen to experts and don't necessarily question them as much as as they should do. Um, great, thank you for that. I'll just in, in, I'll just throw something in that hopefully is relevant as well. Mm -hmm. But I recently watched a, a video, and in the video it showed Pfizer as an example of a, of a pharmaceutical company, and it showed how they sponsor something like sixty different news organizations and media outlets. Mm 
as well. And so I guess there's some sort of sponsorship um, there as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, in the UK, there's something called the Science Media Centre and uh, that, uh, I think I'm right in saying that has links with pharma. It certainly has a lot of people on its, in, on its role, on its role who have links with pharma. And they were very much involved in promoting that study. Okay, great. Uh, next question uh, from Bailey. I'm an undergraduate. Sorry, before, sorry, sorry, Rob. Before we go on to that, just just maybe to add, sure. um, just just add about antidepressants. I, I think they are so key for the psychiatric profession because ever since ever since the profession managed to sort of um, separate itself from the asylums. And, and develop an office-based practice and outpatient practice, antidepressants have been at the heart of it. And so questioning antidepressants does really fundamentally question something about the identity of being a psychiatrist. And I think this is why it was so important um, for you know, many leaders and leading lights in the profession to, you know, to, to market this, this study in the way that they did. Great. And I'll just jump ahead to the questions because Randy yeah, yeah, sure. one reason the media was so positive may have been the difficulty reporters have distinguishing odds ratios from risk ratio reduction. Um, yes. Well, well, another point about that study is, you know, that, that it, it's um, it's a it's not a good presenting odds ratios or risk ratios. Presenting categorical data is complete is a completely unreasonable way to present the data from placebo controlled trials of antidepressants because the data that is collected is a rating scale score. It's a continuous measure, and there is no such thing as so. So the Cipriani study um, reported the odds of response, but there's no such thing as response. Response is a completely arbitrary category that someone has made up and decided, okay, we'll equate a 50% reduction in the Hamilton scale to response. In psychosis, they equate a 30% reduction to response because not many people show a 50% reduction. Uh, it's just completely arbitrary. No one's ever shown that that degree of reduction of, of depression scores correlates with anything that has any meaning. Um, and, and when you categorize data in that way, you easily inflate differences because people who are just different on uh, um, in scores show, show a difference in score of one point can fall into different categories. One person can be a responder, one person can be a non-responder if their if their scores are around the cutoff point. So, um, so not only uh, is there a problem with odds ratios, there's a problem with looking at that data in a categorical sense at all, and they should have been presenting mean differences. I mean, there are lots of problems with the Hamilton scale and with measuring depression, uh, of course, as well. But, but, you know, putting those aside for a moment, they should have just been presenting the mean differences. That, that's the data that was collected. Okay. Uh, next question is from Bailey. I'm an undergraduate in psychology in New Zealand. It is regularly taught that the most efficacious intervention for depression, among other disorders, is therapy combined with medication. Is this simply not true? Or does combined therapy seem to be helpful? Well, I don't think there's any evidence that that antidepressants are any better than placebo. So I don't think, therefore, that combining them with therapy is going to be better than therapy on its own. Uh, and it, it, if you if if you look at the data carefully, you, you there's plenty of evidence that therapy on its own is as good as antidepressants as well, and some evidence that it has more lasting effects. Uh, than, than antidepressants on their own, um, but but yes, I think the question is is it, the fundamental question is are antidepressants better than placebo? And I don't think the evidence supports that. Okay, great. Uh, next question from John B. Can you discuss psychoactive medications and suicidality? Yes, certainly. Um, so th this is a really important issue, uh, and th the history of it is. The, the, that in the early 1990s, when SSRIs were first being used, there were some case reports of people who got into very agitated states and tried to take their own lives. Uh, and, and these were generally people who were quite unwell. They were inpatients at the time. Um, so, but, so, so it wasn't necessarily clear cut that it was the drug effects, but the people treating them, and these were, these were 
psychopharmacologists and mainstream psychiatrists writing up these case studies thought that their behavior had changed when the drug was, when the SSRI was introduced. So that was the first thing that sparked off this concern that SSRI antidepressants in particular might be associated with increased rates of suicide or suicidal behavior and suicidal ideas. Um, and following that, there were a number of meta-analyses looking at rates of suicide, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts in um, placebo-controlled trials of antidepressants. Some of those found um, that rates of suicidal behavior and, and ideation were increased in people on the antidepressants. Some found that they weren't. Um, the uh, more recent ones seem to fairly consistently show that in young people, there is an increase in suicidal behavior and ideation in people on SSRIs compared to people on placebo. The frequency is not high. These are, these are rare events, so it's difficult to show differences. Um, and it's, and it, it seems that in older people, this, this effect doesn't occur. And as I say, and no one is really quite clear why this happens, but there's some evidence that SSRIs are more likely to produce an agitated state in younger people and in older people more likely to induce lethargy. And the agitated state seems to be the state which uh, is associated with suicidal ideation and, and impulsive behaviour and aggression. Um, and the, so, so the best meta-analysis on that is the meta-analysis that was done by Sharma et al in 2016, I think. Uh, and they used clinical study reports. So they didn't get all the data from the drug companies, but they got more data than is just in the published reports. And that, that, was, that was their conclusion from that. Um, now, of course, th there's also been a counter narrative that antidepressants are treating depression and this is reducing suicide rates. So, uh, so the counter narrative has said that, so, so, so in the, in the, um, in the noughties, the FDA placed warnings on some antidepressants to say that they could increase suicidal ideation and, um, uh, and actions among people and uh, among young people in particular, and rates of prescribing of antidepressants to children and young people went down temporarily, they're now going up again. Um, and there were some people saying, oh, look, this is, this is associated with an increase in suicide. Um, this is because we're not treating depression well enough. So once again, that argument comes down to, well, what are antidepressants actually doing? There's, there's no evidence from randomized control trials that they do reduce suicide or suicidal impulses. There's this evidence that they uh, increase them in slightly in younger people. Um, and if you look at completed suicide rates and completed suicide and trends in those rates, it's very difficult to, uh, to show conclusively any, um, any association with the prescribing of antidepressants. Um, I, I've got a slide that shows it well, but I I think it'll take me too long to show to show you. If you look at suicides over the 20th, from since the beginning of the 20th century, what you can see is that they peak at times of economic recession and depression, and they dip at times of war. Uh, and those effects are very marked and other effects are much less clear, except that since about the 1950s, rates of suicide in older people have been declining. Um, so difficult to show anything with suicide, it, it, with completed suicide, but the randomized trials do seem to indicate a slightly increased risk of suicidal behavior in young people on antidepressants compared to placebo, probably associated with this uh, agitation effect that they can sometimes produce. Great, thank you. The next question is from Eric B. I was just at a meeting of doctors using hypnosis to support medicine for both physical like pain and mental like anxiety. Social healing rituals like hypnosis have been documented to help with many of these things for thousands of years. Why are these seemingly not taught or used in medical and psychiatric settings today as interventions that don't have the same risks? Um, I mean, uh, 
why are they not taught today? I suppose because I, I suppose because we have this very evidence based paradigm of medicine at the moment, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this area, so I may be wrong, but I would think that probably there is not a lot of randomized control trial evidence of the use of hypnosis, for example. That doesn't mean that it's not useful uh, in, in many situations. Um, and, you know, I would agree with you that we should be exploring its use much more, particularly for things like pain and anxiety, as you as, as just see that you've mentioned, um, where, where hypnosis, relaxation, I wouldn't necessarily call it, hip, hip, I mean, I, I think what's important about hypnosis is a, is a state of deep relaxation. Um, th there has been interest in, interest in mindfulness, which is, is similar um, recently, and there have even been some studies of mindfulness. So I think there is some interest in, uh, in this sort of intervention, but I agree with you, not enough uh, for all sorts of reasons. You know, um, the reasons that, the, the, you know, the all sorts of reasons why we um, jump to prescribing a pill rather than thinking about other ways of, of helping people. Um, so, so all those professional interests that I discussed, but also I would say, uh, you know, some of the pressure to take pills, to have pills, comes from people themselves who are often looking for um, for a quick fix, rather than rather than something that's going to actually take you know maybe take longer and and take more effort. Great. The next question is from Eric K. I hold a psychological injury model. People have severe negative emotions or troubling thoughts slash behavior from being abused or neglected earlier in life. There is a strong dose response relationship between ACEs, it'll be adverse childhood events, and every psychiatric disorder such as depression, etc. They may or may not benefit from psychoactive pills to moderate or numb these emotions. Do you see that a psychological injury model is in conflict with a drug centered model or in synergy with it? So, uh, so I think it's completely compatible with a drug centered model. Um, I mean, I completely, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the majority of people who, you know, who, who end up being diagnosed certainly with severe um, mental health problems have uh, ha have suffered abuse, neglect, and and other adverse life events and circumstances, um, and. Uh, and uh, you, you know, and and, and are, are struggling because of that. Have, have have therefore found it difficult to regulate their emotions. They may still be suffering from sadness or grief or trauma or stress that's directly a result of the, of those uh, um, of those events. We can medicate those feelings away sometimes temporarily in some people, just as you can go out and get drunk and and temporarily, um, you know, temporarily find relief from from uh, um, for, from from troubling thoughts and sadness and misery um, but that's just not generally helpful to people in the long term and in the long term we need to help people to find ways to process uh, and move on from um, th th those th th things that have happened to them so so I think the I think the drug-centered model is is completely compatible with with that sort of uh, with that sort of thinking. Um, I, I, I also like, so, so related to that, I like um, the psychological idea that people people get into bad habits. I think I think some of the mental health problems we see are a result of people's um, maladaptive attempts to deal with adverse circumstances and and you know abuse and neglect and things like that, um, adverse life events. Uh, it, you know, one, one way of, of dealing with those things is to cut yourself off, is to withdraw, is to, you know, become, um, you know, not, not, not put yourself at risk anymore, uh, which can lead, you know, which, which can become a state of depression or a state of psychosis. Uh, and uh, and, and, th and th this used to be a way of thinking in mainstream psychiatry back in the 20th century. And I think part of the role of, of, of counsellors and therapists, as well as psychiatrists, anyone who works with people with mental health problems, is to try and help them to find more adaptive ways of managing their emotions and 
uh, managing what's happened to them in the past and moving on from it, processing it and moving on from it. Great, thank you. The next question from Lauren. Thank you for your powerful talk, Dr. Moncrief. Can you comment on what training programs can do to highlight political systemic reasons for mental illness, depression, and what schools of psychology, but I'll add psychiatry since you're a psychiatry program, what schools of psychology and psychiatry should add to the curriculum to address these systemic factors? So a good, a, that's a really good question um, that I'm not sure I have a very good answer to. Um, but I think, I, I mean, to some extent we do learn about this, but I think we learn, need to le learn more about the, the way that our mental states reflect our social circumstances and the social and economic system that we live in. Um, and we need to reflect on that more uh, and, you know, become, become better informed about, about social and economic circumstances and trends. Um, but, but, it, but it does suggest that the answer is not with us, but is out there in society. The answer is actually to, you know, to create a better society and to provide better social for support and social facilities to people um, uh, outside of the professional arena. You know, pro professionals can do something, but, but, but a professional is always going to be a band-aid really and the, um, and the real solution needs to be in creating a more uh, accepting and support and supportive society in my view great thank you next question from christina fascinating talk thanks so much do you see any similarities between the situation you describe and the situation how covid vaccines are advertised and pushed on people <laughs> uh, that would have been a very controversial question um, a few months ago, which I would have refused to answer, <laughs> um, but, but I will have a go at it now. Um, yes, I absolutely do. And I have been shocked and horrified at how accepting people have been of COVID vaccines, which were tested for a very short period of time uh, with very little research done on their long-term effects. That's very similar to psychiatric drugs. Um, and not very good evidence really about their real world costs and benefits. Uh, so I, I, I see a lot of parallels and of course they were also, um, also produced by a powerful pharmaceutical company that has the data uh, and you know, has, hasn't released the data for it to be scrutinized by anyone else as yet. Uh, and is trying not to ever release it or not to release it for a very long time as far as I know. So that's my answer to that now. Great, thank you. Next question from Jess. Is biomedical research actively pursuing objective indices of psychiatric dysfunction? A physician would never treat a broken limb without first imaging the site of the pain. It seems absurd to me that an entire industry has been built on treating emotional pain without being able to locate a definitive biomedical cause. Another good question that, again, I'm not sure I have a very good answer to. Um, I mean, there is endless theory after endless theory about the, you know, biological origins of schizophrenia and, uh, um, and, and depression and bipolar disorder. I just uh, came across a paper today, which is about the gut biome. It's a systematic review of all the studies that have looked at the gut biome and whether that predicts um, is associated with with these various diagnoses and guess what? It's not. <laughs> um, the research is very inconsistent and doesn't point in any, um, any suggestive directions. So, uh, so people have been trying to show this for a long time. I, I mean, I think the problem, is that the, the fundamental problem is that we are misunderstanding states of emotional distress. They are not bio, they are not fundamentally biological states. They are fundamentally human states, fundamentally states of human of human beings who are social animals, social creatures, uh, and our emotional lives are not simply a reflex manifestation of something you know a biological event in our body. They are a very complex. Um, response to our environment, which involve all sorts of 
judgments, rational judgments and evaluations, including moral evaluations. You know, feeling sad is, is a response to something that the individual um, has defined as, as something that they don't like, that is morally bad or hurtful to them or unpleasant. Um, and all those judgments require sophisticated human um, intellectual capacities. Uh, and, uh, and, and those capacities are socially learnt capacities, uh, social capacities. They're not capacities that are uh, just inherent in an individual's biology. So I think the problem is that we're starting from the wrong point of view, that the um, human emotional problems are not biological problems. And the more and, and looking in the brain for them is looking in the wrong place. We're not going to find the answer there. That doesn't mean that we can't um, modify emotional and mental states by using drugs. Uh, we can, as, as we know, um, when we when we have a, a drink of alcohol. Um, and but we I, I think we need to pay more attention to the phenomenal level and stop worrying about the biology and think, you know what, we know that drugs affect our mental states. Let's let's think carefully about how they do that. Describe how they do that, what it feels like, what sort of experiences these drugs, um, these different drugs produce. Uh, and, uh, and and then and that I think will allow us to think more carefully about, you know, about when they're useful and when they're not useful. Again, you know, if we think about recreational drugs, we know that it's not a good idea to blot out your emotions every day with alcohol. That doesn't usually produce any solution for um, for anyone. Uh, and 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 in a similar way, it's probably not going to produce a solution for someone to blot out their emotions with. SSRIs or, or and it may be not quite blotting out, may just be dampening, but again, it's probably not likely to produce a long-term solution for people um, to be using psychiatric drugs either in that sort of situation. Great, thank you. So you've answered 13 questions. We have time for one more question. I apologize that we did not get to all the posted questions um, and I'm sure people had unposted questions. So make sure you, uh, you know, join in in a, in a couple of minutes to the other link that I sent out. If you have problems accessing or can't find the link, you can also email me. But let's just go to the last question of the day because now it's getting late for Dr. Moncrief. So the last question we'll take is from Bailey. If it was to be globally recognized that the psychiatric medication is not as great as they seem, would that harm the validity of the psychological practice as an academic realm and as a professional realm? Another good question. Um, I mean, certainly, it, it, it's certainly going to be difficult for psychiatrists because of their medical status uh, and, you know, the, the role of psychiatrists recently has become more and more focused on prescribing drugs. Will it, will it do harm to psychologists and to other people in the mental health profession? I, I don't think so. I think, um, I think there are lots of other ways to help people. Yes, those ways might not look quite so technical, so scientific. And of course, science always confers status, which confers, you know, higher incomes. Um, so, so I think I, I think I would say, but, but then but something like social work is, uh, you know, is a profession that is respected and is not pretending to you know, be a natural scientific discipline. Um, so I, I, you know, I, th I think, I think mental health professionals need to, you know, need, need, need to carve out their area of expertise uh, without pretending that it is um, medical or, you know, or an area of biological science, um, but being honest about the fact that it's about helping people who are in trouble and finding, finding ways to do that. <laughs> Okay, so Dr. Moncrief, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise, uh, wisdom and knowledge with us. Uh, and I know it's getting late, so I appreciate uh, you sticking around and giving this talk at a time that's convenient for us. If I'm correct, I believe it's now 9 p.m. for you. It is, it is, and I would, would very much like to go and get some dinners. So. <laughs> Absolutely not. But again, thank you so much for taking the time. and I look forward to speaking to those who uh, will stick around and join the other room. Uh, for some discussion. Thank you. Thank you for everyone's comments and, and the questions. And it was very enjoyable. Thanks. Great. And so okay. this concludes the uh, Confronting Hegemonic uh, 
speaker series webinar talk, and I will open up the Zoom room within a minute. So hopefully I'll see some people there. <laughs>